Good morning. I want to welcome you to Big Canoe Chapel, those of you who are in the chapel, as well as those of you who are watching online. I've asked Ansley Francis to join me because today is a very important day in her life. Not only is she going to be reading scripture as she did at 9 o'clock, she'll be reading at this service, but also what's going to happen today at noon? I'm getting baptized. She's being baptized. <clears throat> Ansley has been a part of this chapel since she was 18 months old. <laughs> Recently she uh, spoke with me and with David about her faith journey and about her accepting Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And she requested to be baptized by immersion. So we will be meeting at the pool, the aquatic center at noon. And we want to invite any of you who can and will or would like to, to come and be a part of that but thank you. I'd like to pray with you, okay? Gracious God, we thank you for Ansley and for her life. We thank you for her faith journey. And we pray today as we have the privilege of being a part of her baptism, a holy step, that it would be a time where we feel your holy presence and that, Lord Jesus, you would assure her as well as all of us of your marvelous love. For we offer Ansley and our prayer to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Jeff Downing is the chair of our endowment committee. Jeff, would you come and share with us, please? Yes, thank you, and good morning. It has been my privilege to serve on the endowment committee for several years now. And this morning, I wish to give you an update on our endowment fund and also announce a special opportunity to enhance that fund. The purpose of our endowment fund created in 2006 by three generous chapel members is to provide for the chapel's needs beyond the traditional annual giving and to ensure its long-term health. Annual tithes and giving support the day-to-day -day expenses of the chapel and its missions. The endowment fund provides for special programs, missions, and unanticipated needs which are usually unforeseen at the time of the annual tithing campaign, stewardship campaign, which, which determines our annual budget just completed. A couple of recent examples would be the purchasing of equipment to allow the Big Canoe Chapel to broadcast their services, the redesign of the chapel website, scholarships, altar cross repair, cemetery care, and technology equipment. So annual giving provides for our day-to-day -day operational needs and missions. The endowment fund provides for unanticipated needs, emergencies, and the future of the chapel in perpetuity. These endowment funds are carefully managed by the endowment committee, the finance committee, and, and of course our board of trustees. I'm excited to announce this morning an opportunity to support both the endowment fund legacy and a long-term member of our congregation who gave so much of his time, talents, and fortune to this chapel and the surrounding community. That is, of course, David Howe, who was our endowment committee chair for several years and who provided great leadership during that time before turning over the reins to Beverly Zimmerman, who has continued that great leadership. David also served the chapel and the community in numerous ways and left a legacy of caring and love. So I'm very pleased to announce that an anonymous donor has created a named endowment in David's name, and another generous anonymous donor has pledged $50,000 in additional matching donations to contributions to the David Howe Memorial Fund. This provides a wonderful opportunity to join the Big Canoe Chapel Endowment Fund legacy while also honoring David in providing for our chapel's future needs. Now, let's hear from David directly with his testimony last year during the stewardship campaign. I think about the way that God has blessed me, I have to think back to the way I was at one time in my life and the way that I feel that I am at this time. 
before, my life was based on the strength and, and uh, courage that I had to do my own thing. I was working on my own, my own strengths and my own blessings as I saw them. What I didn't realize was that when I, looked, when I took the words believe and achieve, the word believe was really me believing in myself. And this went on for a long time during my career until several incidents in, in my life, not the least of which was the birth of my children, uh, occurrences that happened in my business career, that I realized that it wasn't only me that was making these things happen. And it was around that time that I became aware, more aware than ever, that God was right here beside me waiting for him to come to him. What stewardship means to me and how I've used God's blessings to honor him uh, ever since that change in my life, and that included bringing Jesus into my heart. I've learned that giving is more important than receiving in such a strong way. My life in the chapel with the people that I've met with the the wonderful encouragement and, and strength that I felt from those relationships has brought me to understand that I need the help as well as everybody to support the chapel, to keep the chapel in financial well-being, and to help the chapel move on forward. My life has changed since discovering how God's blessings flow through me. I depend upon him and belief in him as I used to believe in myself. And I love the, I love the words of Jesus in, in Matthew, my burden is light, take my yoke. And I've tried to do that. Was that not wonderful? Peggy, may I ask you and your family to stand and let us recognize you for the tremendous contribution. <laughs> we are honored to do so. Thank you. If you wish to support the David Howe Memorial Fund with a tax-deductible tax deductible gift, which will be doubled, you may do so by scanning the QR code on your program insert or by visiting the chapel website and clicking on the giving tab or by contacting an endowment committee member that you can recognize with their green name tag today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to lead us in the call to worship. Will you please stand? And let's read together from the worship folder and responsively. In the midst of strife, God is with us. In the anguish of everyday living, God is with us. Come, let us open our hearts and spirits to the Lord. We come with confidence and hope in the presence of God. Amen.
Be seated, please. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. What do we have today? I see several objects. What, what is this? The Bible. The what? The Bible. The Bible. Is that your copy of the Bible? Yes, sir. Can I see it? Wow. What color is that? Pink. I don't think I've ever seen a pink Bible. That certainly is beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you. And what do we have here? What did you bring? A light. A light. Doesn't look like a light to me. It looks like a piece of plastic. How, do, how does it work? Um, by pressing a button that says press. Oh, the one that says press? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can I try that again? Yes. This is a flashlight for all of you. And we push this button. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what do you have? What'd you bring me? A maraca. A maraca. What do we do with a maraca? Uh, make music. Well, make some. Uh huh. Make it. Do it. Yeah. Do it with vigor. <laughs> Can you do that? All right. You got it. And what do we have over here? What do we have? What what is that? A doll. A what? A doll. A doll. Wow. Can I see that doll? Can I see? And what's the doll's name? Um, I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Well, you know something? Do you know what this week is? Anybody know what this week is? Thanksgiving. It's what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And what do we do during Thanksgiving week and especially on Thanksgiving Day? Spend what? time together. Spend time together. Very good. What else do you do? Yeah. Give thanks. Oh, yes, we give thanks. Very good. What else do we do? We what? We give. We give. Okay. Anything else? We eat delicious food. That's right. We eat delicious <laughs> food. Exactly. And for all of that, we give thanks to God. To God. That's right. So make sure that not only on Thanksgiving Day, but every day we give thanks to the Lord. Amen. So would you pray with me? I'll say a phrase and then you say it after me. Okay? Dear God, Dear God we thank you, we thank you on, Thanksgiving week on Thanksgiving week and every day, and every day for your love, for your, love your, forgiveness, your forgiveness and most of all, most of all for your holy presence. For your holy presence. In, Jesus name, In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for being part of worship. I hope you're getting to know some folks sitting around you. One way that helps us, and you're getting to know each other, was there should be a little black vinyl pad somewhere on your, on your pew. If you don't mind finding that, and take it and fill it out and then pass it on to others on your pew. That, that, I think that will help you, even as you pass it back, others on the pew get to know you. We're honored to have you all. Actually, that list that you're writing on will help us in the office learn how to pray with, pray for you, stay in touch with you. So we're honored. Those of you on, uh, watching us online, we're very honored that you're part of our worship. In just a minute, we're going to pray. And we're going to pray for you, but at the same time, those of us in this room, we have, we have a growing list of things for which we're praying. We pray for each other. If you have a worship folder, you'll notice we've listed several names. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to choose not to read them all, but there are some folks in our church family who really are walking through some very uh, deep valleys right now. Without me trying to list them all, you see uh, the uh, grandson of uh, uh, John and Maureen, uh, they are now back from London after the death of their grandson. 
but you also see Walt Samples. Many of you may have known him. But we, we did not include this in the worship folder because it happened just so recently. Now, many of you know Karen and John Anderson. Actually, Karen, on many occasions, works with us in the sound booth. Her, um, her dad passed away right at one month ago. Her mom passed away this weekend. And so she knows that this church family is her family and um, lifting her up, but just wanted to make sure that you know gives us an opportunity to pray. Don't forget to be praying for our former pastor, Lynn Walker. Notice that there are so many things that we could be listing on here, but there's some folks even in this room who are needing us to pray, and so we do that with great joy. After I've had a chance to pray with you and for you, I'm going to invite you to join me, and we're going to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you on behalf of us all. Thank you for the privilege you give us to even come in your presence. Don't ever let me take that for granted. But thank you for the, what you have done in allowing us to come even in boldness. We pray for ourselves. We pray for each other. We pray for the chapel. We pray for our nation and certainly for the world. Lord, teach us how to pray. Father, we acknowledge there's some folks, some of whom we know very well, others we don't know, but we're, who are really going through some times of the, we're needing you more than perhaps ever. So teach us how to pray for others. And Father, as we pray and as we worship this morning, allow us to experience the very power of your presence. Father, teach us how to pray. And Lord, teach us how to pray just as you taught your followers how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Lord Jesus, thank you for everything you've given us. When we acknowledge who you are and when we don't even know how to put things into words, but thank you, Father. And for a time like this, when we have an opportunity as part of worship to try to give back to you, we do so with joy. We also do that with humility. Father, thank you for all you've done. And thanks for the privilege you give us to, as part of worship, give back. Bless those who give. Bless those who are going to be receiving the ministry that's expressed here. And Lord, we do thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm and a little honey, some spices, myrrh, some pistachio nuts, and almonds. Genesis 43, 11. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Standing for our prayer, please. Gracious and almighty God, as we come to Thanksgiving Sunday, as we reflect and as we look forward about the abundance of what you have given and blessed each of us, I pray that as we contemplate and try to discern what you would say to us through Scripture, that you would be with preacher and listener alike, so that we might discover you afresh. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I had been the pastor at the Sam Jones Memorial Church about six months when a group of three businessmen in the church approached me and they said, would you like to be on live television uh, in our area? I said, well, I, I don't know. And they said, we will pay for it. And so it was, it was done. So we were on at 11 o'clock live, then Sunday afternoon, and then Monday through Friday, we were on at 7.30 at night. I told you that to say that if you make a mistake in a worship service, <laughs> it is shown over and over and over. I even asked them, as we would, I would make many mistakes, and still do. I would say, can you edit that out? You know, and they said, no, no, it's the way it is. And I want to tell you about one of my most embarrassing ones. We had received the offering, and the ushers had come forward, and I was standing there to receive the offering like, like David does for us. And one of the ushers handed me a piece of paper that was folded. And so I had the prayer, and then I went up to preach the sermon, and I opened the note, and it said, the family of Mrs. So-and-so has called. 
she has died. And we wanted to announce that she has died and ask for the prayers of the congregation. So we finished singing the doxology, we have the hymn of preparation. <clears throat> Before the sermon, I said I have uh, an announcement. And I read that so and so had died. The family wanted us to announce that. And they're seeking your prayers. Then I read the scripture, had the sermon, and then we stood to sing the final hymn. Lauren Usher came and gave a note to the associate pastor, a retired gentleman. He was heavy set, delightful, wonderful man. And I see him open up this piece of paper, and he's standing beside me, and I see his whole body shaking like this. <laughs> and I thought, is he laughing, or is he okay, or whatever? And then he hands it to me. Fortunately, we're still singing. I open the note. This is Mrs. So-and-so. <laughs> I am very much alive. Please announce to the congregation that I am alive and I will be there next Sunday to see them. Well, I folded the piece of paper over and I said to my associate pastor, I said, I have an idea. And he said, what's that? I said, well, after all, you are the pastor of pastoral care. So why don't you make this announcement? I saw him chuckling again and handed it back to me. And he said, well, you are the senior minister. And after all, you are the one who announced her death. Now you can announce her resurrection. <laughs> and so I did. And for 12 years, I heard about that over and over again, what had happened. But as I reflect upon that, maybe in your life and in mine, there's some things that need to die. And maybe in your life as well as mine, there's some things that need to be resurrected. Maybe in your life and mine, we need to let die some of those old wounds. Some of those memories that haunt us. Maybe we need to let die an unforgiving spirit. Maybe that person really did hurt you. And maybe they even did it on purpose. Maybe we need to let go of that and let that die. Maybe there's some old griefs and we just haven't faced them. And maybe there needs to be some resurrection in our lives. Maybe there's some prejudice in our hearts that we really don't like to talk about or think about. Maybe we need to ask the Spirit to resurrect in us a loving spirit towards everybody. Maybe for you and for me, we need to have a resurrection of grace. A resurrection of realizing who's really the King of glory. And it's not us. Maybe we need to have a resurrection of that he's the creator and we're the created. He's the boss, not us. I don't know what you need to let die in your life, but you do. Are you going to? I don't know what needs to be resurrected in your life but you do. Are you going to let the Holy Spirit do that for you? You can't do it on your own. You've already tried that. You're a miserable failure at it, and so am I. Let Jesus transform you. Let him do it for you. 
through you. You know, I found it quite interesting. When you study the scripture, Jesus had two habits. Only twice is a reference made to that, and they're both in the Gospel of Luke. Habit number one, as was his habit, referring to Jesus, he went to the synagogue to worship. Second habit, as was his habit, he went to be with God to pray. Are those your habits? And if they're not, why not? If they're important to Jesus, why aren't they important to you? If I had a, a tablet at the door when you came in and asked you to write down two of your habits, would it have been worship and prayer? Friends, if you want to know how to have resurrection in your soul of that which needs to be resurrected, and if you want to have a death in your soul of those things that need to die, then take on the holy habits of Jesus. As was his habit, he worshiped. As was his habit, he prayed. Do you? And if not, why not? If you want to have joy, take on the holy habits of Jesus. You know, there's a nugget of truth in the scripture that was read today that I think sometimes we overlook because it's a long story that I will just briefly tell you that you all, I'm sure, already know about Joseph, and this is contained in it. But sometimes I think we miss this little nugget because we focus on the entirety of the story, which is many, many sermons can and have been and will be preached about that. But in the 37th chapter of Genesis, prior to the one that was read today, we know that Joseph was the favorite of his father, Jacob. And Jacob favored him so much that his brothers resented it. And so therefore, when they saw him coming and then the father had given Joseph only the coat of many colors and they saw him coming with that coat of many colors, they said, let's kill him. And that was their plan. But when he approached them, they saw a caravan. You remember the story. The caravan was going to Egypt and they said, let's sell him. So they sold him as a slave to the caravan and they took that coat of many colors and they put some animal blood on it and went back to the father, Jacob, and said, he's dead. Years passed. Joseph became a, a slave there in Egypt. Potiphar, who he was a slave in his home, a servant in his home. There, Potiphar's wife accused him of trying to seduce her. Really, she tried to seduce him. And he said, no, I'm going to be faithful to my God. I'm not going to participate in this. She then accused him of trying to seduce her. He was put in prison. In prison, he interpreted some dreams. Then the ruler had a dream, heard that Joseph could interpret dreams. He interpreted the dream. The, the ruler said, now you're going to be one of my governors. You're going to be a ruler. And he was in charge of the distribution of wheat and grain. And there was a famine, as you know, in Israel. Egypt had plenty of grain. So Joseph sent the boys to get the grain. They appear before their brother, Joseph, not knowing that it's their brother. And he, Joseph asked them a lot of questions about their family. And they wondered why, it says scripture. And then they purchased the grain. And Joseph instructs the person, persons who were loading the bags of grain to put their money in there and let them have their money and the grain. And when they get back to Israel, they find that. The grain is spent, it's used. So then they come back and Joseph tells them, you've got a younger brother, his name is Benjamin. I'm not going to give you the grain till you bring Benjamin. They go back and Jacob says, I don't want to send Benjamin, but to get the grain we have to, and that's why the scripture says. And then their father Jacob said to them, if it must be so, meaning if, it, if I have to send Benjamin, I've already lost my favorite son, but if I have to send Benjamin, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry them down and present them to the man. The man is his own son, but he doesn't know that. To the man. A little balm, a little honey, gum, resin, pistachio nuts, 
and almonds. Let's think about that for a moment. Especially on Thanksgiving Sunday. Maybe we need to give a little honey. Give a little kindness. Give a little graciousness. Give a little sweet attention to someone whether they deserve it or not. Give a little honey as we develop the habits of Jesus. As was his habit, he worshiped. As was his habit, he prayed. I have a friend named Ralph. Ralph is a good bit younger than me. He was telling me about his mother, and I have met his mother, and she is a huge Atlanta Falcon fan. I am too, but not like her. So pray for us. It's hard to be an Atlanta Falcon fan. <laughs> But she is a bigger fan than I am. Every year she purchases a jersey of her favorite player. This year it's Bojan Robinson, the running back from Texas, the eighth pick in the first round, scoring his first touchdown, and she watches the games all the time. Ralph has tried to get her to go. First it was Atlanta, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, Mercedes-Benz, Georgia Dome. She won't go, she says, because you have to Go downtown where all the bad people are. <laughs> we'll get robbed if we go to downtown. You know, those kind of people are downtown. Ralph has tried and tried to get her to go. She loves Robinson. And when Robinson scored that touchdown, she told Ralph, we're going to go. I want to go. He said, we're going to ride Marta. She said, no, I don't want. He said, we're going to ride Marta, mother. That's the way to get there. She said, I don't want to. Ralph said that whenever he'd call her over the years as during a Falcon game, she wouldn't answer the phone. He'll leave a message on her answering machine, Mother, pick up the phone. It's an emergency. She won't do it. And then when the game's over, she'll call him back. She said, what do you want? He said, Mother, it was an emergency. She said, I was watching the Falcons. <laughs> he said, but Mother, I needed to talk to you. She, and she will say, Son, you need to get your priorities right. I'm watching the Falcons. Ralph says she sits there with that jersey on, the jersey of the year. She has that Falcon cap on, but she moves it over to the right because she's got her hair fixed on Thursday for bridge on Friday, church on Sunday, and she doesn't want to get it messed up, so she cocks it over to the side. He said she sits there with her Diet Coke, her two sleeves of peanuts, her one pack of cheese, peanut butter crackers, and her Diet Coke, and she will not be disturbed during the Falcons game. Ralph goes over to pick her up. They're going to the game, what, two weeks ago? Or what? And he sees his mother's purse is a little larger than usual, the one she usually carries. He said, Mother, you, you usually carry the other purse. She said, I know. I've got my Diet Coke in here. I've got my two sleeves of peanuts. I've got my cheese and peanut butter crackers. He said, then I can let you in. She said, just watch me. I'll get it in. They get down, they get close to Marta, he sees her doing this. It's like she's going to the goal line with a football. She's trying to protect it. She's afraid some of those kinds of people might hurt her or try to steal it from her. They get on the busy Marta train, packed. She's clutching this bag, Ralph tells me. And a hand from a young man who's 22, 23, something like that. And it was a different color from her hand. He reached up and touched her on the hand. She took that purse <laughs> and went back. And as he was about to hit this gentleman, he said, ma'am, ma'am, stop. I want to give you my seat. And she said, oh. She clutches her bag and sits down. He says, I see you've got on a Robinson jersey. He said, I like him. Yeah. She said, he went to the University of Texas. He said, I know. He said, boy, he scored that touchdown last week. Wasn't that great? He's a wonderful runner. And Ralph said a transformation took place. His mother started a relationship and a conversation. And then when they started to get off, he reached down and said, may I help you? And he helped her off. And then they walked in the stadium together. Ralph was like an incidental person there. By the way, she got in with her purse. <laughs> and then when they parted in the stadium, went their different ways, Ralph expected, well, this will all be over. They sat down to watch the game. Ralph said she did not talk about the game. She talked about the young man named Robert. 
and his kindness. Who talks about you and your kindness? Who? Who talks about your unkindness? Who? Give a little honey. Give a little honey. Be gracious. Be kind. You never know when a miracle is going to transport them. You never know. Where we live, there's a CVS pharmacy that we trade with. It's a very busy drugstore. I had a prescription, long line. I'm waiting in line. Here's the scenario. There's a gentleman here, then there's a lady here, then me, and then people behind me. Finally, it got to this lady, and she went up. The clerk asked you know, her name, birth date, and so forth, goes back, gets a prescription. You know the routine. This gentleman then goes up. He's probably 35-ish, something like that. He goes up, gives his name, birth date. Young girl, who, by the way, was expecting a child. Looked like she's 25-ish. She said, I'm sorry, your prescription is not ready. What's wrong with you? This is the worst drugstore I've ever been in. It's your fault. She starts crying. He looks at the pharmacist. He said, why don't you do your job? Why don't you supervise these people? Why don't you make them? I can't believe I even do business with you people. You do not deserve my money. And he just chewed everybody out. Finally, the pharmacist came over and said, Sir, if you'll be seated in those chairs, we'll have your prescription ready in a few minutes. The lady in front of me goes up, gives her name, birth date, young lady, wiping tears, gets it, gives it to her. It's now my turn. I go up, I could read her badge. It said Sherry. I went up. She said, What's your name? I said, Sherry. And I reached over and took her hand. I said, Sherry, I think you're doing a great job. And I said it loud enough for him to hear it. And then I pointed to the pharmacist. I said, and you help all of us and for all your staff. Thank you for what you do. I gave her my name, my birth date. She went and got my prescription. I turned around, and this guy gets out of his chair. It comes right up to me. I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's bigger than me. <laughs> He's younger than me. He comes right up to me. He said, you're right. And he turned to the sherry and said, I owe you an apology. I'm sorry. To the pharmacist, I owe you an apology. To all of you, I apologize. And I tapped him on the shoulder and said, thank you, sir. Happy Thanksgiving. Who do you need to treat like that? Who do you need to treat like that? Who do you need to treat like that? Who do I need to treat like that? Give a little honey. And you can only do that when you take on the two habits of Jesus. As was his habit, he worshiped. As was his habit, he prayed. Do you? Will Williman, of course, Spark, you know Dr. Williman. Will Williman, a prolific writer, correct? Pro prolific writer. Last year, at Thanksgiving, he said he was with his family. And his latest book had come out. They were all congratulating him. Tell him what a wonderful book. What an impact he made upon society. He's a preacher, a philosopher, a theologian, etc. They said, oh, you've just helped so many people. And he said he enjoyed every second of the praise. Just soaking it in. Until his little sister said, Will, aren't you glad mama made you learn typing? <laughs> and he said, what? And then his brother said, yeah, well... I, you know, you never liked typing. She made you do it. I remember you'd sit down at the kitchen table with that old manual royal typewriter. Any of you old enough to remember those? You know? 
Remember how it would ding when it got to the end? It didn't go back. Those of you who are younger, let me explain this to you. you know, I wasn't talking to you, Dennis. <laughs> but they, they would ding, and then you'd take the carriage, and you'd push it back manually, then you'd type, and when it got to the end, it would ding, and you go back and forth. Well, he said, you would sit there with your fingers and just peck, and Mother would come in and say, don't do that. You got to learn to type the right way, and you resented it, and you wouldn't talk back to her, but you sat there and you learned to do it. Aren't you glad? And Will Willimon said, he sort of came out of himself. Instead of all the praise and adoration he was getting, he thought, I owe a debt of gratitude to my mother. And so he goes up to his mother and said, Mother, thank you. Thank you for caring enough to teach me how to type. I'm indebted to you. And he hugged her. To whom do you need to say that to? This week, at your family gathering, and if you're not going to see him, call him, email him. To whom do you need to say thank you? I'm indebted to you. I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for you. Two men were arrested and incarcerated unjustly. They were really innocent. They were in jail for four months. New evidence was discovered, and they both were released. One of the men was a wreck. One of the men was doing good. And they asked the man who was doing good, they said, how'd you do it? How did you sustain your spirit? He said, I refused to decorate my cell. They said, well, what does that mean? He said, I refuse to accept this as all that there is. And I could only do that because I turned to my Lord and gave thanks every day. They said, you're in jail. I gave thanks every day for his holy presence. Do you? Will you? Two habits of Jesus. As was his habit, he worshiped. As was his habit, he prayed. Give a little, honey. I want to close with this. Minnie Pierce lives in Detroit. She's in college. She was selected in her drama department to be, have the lead in a play. They had the play. And the opening night, the author of the play was there. She didn't know that, but he came to the play. And afterward, he went backstage and he met Minnie Pierce. And he said, Miss Pierce, I want to say something to you. I'm the author. He said, I've seen this play presented many, many times. But you tonight exemplified and embodied exactly what I envisioned when I created that character. Thank you. Now, wouldn't it be great if at the end of our lives, the Lord Jesus would look at you and at me and say, when I created you, when I knit you together in your mother's womb, and as I've watched you and enabled you, you embodied exactly what I had in mind when I created you. Thank you. Give a little, honey. And I want to say a personal word to you. I want to thank you for giving honey to Patty and I. We've now been your interim senior pastor and wife for 15 months. And I want to thank you. You blessed our lives. You have taught us many things. 
You have enabled us to grow in ways because you have been gracious and you have been kind. We're in the vernacular of the day. You have given us a lot of honey, and we thank you. And as we collectively and individually move into a Thanksgiving week, prayerfully and deliberately contemplate working into your life the two habits of Jesus, the only two habits of Jesus. As was his habit, he worshiped. As was his habit, he prayed. May it be so for all of us called by his blessed day. Amen. Gracious and almighty God, we do give thanks. So many, many blessings, the bounty of which is unlimited with you. Help us to focus upon you and develop your two holy habits of prayer and worship. So this can be the greatest thanksgiving we've ever had because we give a little honey. In your holy name we pray. Amen.